Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest LPL Market Signals. Jeff Bookbinder, your host for this week, with my friend and colleague, Lawrence Gillum. Going to talk some stocks and some bonds. How are you today, Lawrence? I'm doing good, Jeff. How are you? Doing just fine. Doing just fine. Good weekend. Uh, and, um, you know, kind of well, interesting. Was it really a good weekend? I, I'm sitting here reveling in the another victory of UNC over Duke over the, over the weekend. Well, that's that's a fair point. I, I mean, I'm more of a Kansas basketball fan than a Duke fan, and they are collapsing just like Duke has. So, fair point. I am not real happy with with my college basketball. So, I'll just be thinking about the Chiefs Super Bowl for maybe another you know, couple couple months. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, good uh, good weekend for sure here. Uh, the uh, the the week you know last week's end to the market um, action was a little bit sloppy. And uh, I think, you know, we'll certainly talk about that here uh, in a minute. But first, uh, these wonderful disclosures. It is Monday, March 11th, 2024, as we are recording this. And um, um, we got a full agenda. So let's just get right to it. Not spend any more time talking about the Tar Heels and the Blue Doubles. <laughs> I know you're a Carolina fan, Lawrence. So congrats to the Tar Heels. Uh, so here's what we got. Market recap. Uh, we had a late week tech sell-off. Uh, now the MAG-7 is kind of dispersing, right? So we're seeing these things move in different directions. But all in all, week uh, tech was down for the week. And certainly the biggest reason why uh, the S&P was down uh, over the five trading days. Um, the job support really wasn't too much of the reason in our view. Uh, but we'll we'll give you some key takeaways from that. Uh, then we'll bring in uh, our bond geek, and Lawrence will talk about high yield maturity wall uh, getting pushed out. This actually, um, you know, with rising interest rates, the economy is really, or corporate America, more specifically, is highly dependent on being able to refinance. So this is not just a bond geek issue. This is an issue that's mattered uh, for um, equity investors, for economists. Uh, it, it you know these are these are important issues um, that aren't just uh, limited to the bond market. Uh, next, we'll highlight the weekly market commentary, which is on gold recent breakout to all time highs. Certainly, we're getting a lot of questions from um, from folks about gold and and where we see it going from here. Uh, and then finally, the week ahead, where we have CPI and retail sales. So, uh, market recap first. I think uh, a question a lot of people were asking as they were watching these huge moves in the big tech stocks late last week is, is this a sign of a top? And does it mean uh, that, um, you know, the, the broad market will 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 correct? And, and we don't necessarily think so. We'll show you the performance table in a minute, but it's really more of a rotation uh, than um, the ingredients for a correction, at least in our view in the near term. So... I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. So here's the chart of the S&P. You see here, it's just basically been a straight line up. We haven't even had a 2% pullback, uh, let alone the 5% that you typically need to qualify as a pullback. So sure, we need a we need a breather. We, we need a break. Uh, we're obviously going to get a dip at some point. Uh, maybe what we saw late last week is the start of it, but... You know the fundamentals to us still look pretty good uh, here at LPR Research, so we're not uh, we're not actively uh, you know talking about sidestepping and and trying to avoid a, a correction or anything like that. Still, still fundamentals look 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 pretty good, and the technicals look pretty good too. You have um, you know pretty good breadth here uh, at the bottom. You see the percentage of members with a fourteen day RSI, so relative strength index over seventy is overbought. Um, we don't have a very high percentage that's over 70. In fact, we're not we're not as overbought as we were just a few months ago. Uh, we're not as overbought as we were in, uh, in in late 2021, heading into early 2022. So sure, a little overbought, <clears throat> but we've taken a little bit of the heat out by just sort of you know bouncing around here over the past few days. So um, in terms of intermarkets, we'll start with uh, equities, then I'll go to you, Lawrence. The um, you see here the tech sector was down about one point one percent for the week, so that's really the reason why you had the S and P down, only 02 
percent down uh, for the week, so a modest uh, decline. But you see the Nasdaq uh, a large decline uh, down one point one percent. So if you know where the Mag Seven is located in terms of the sectors, all those sectors were down. So tech, obviously, consumer discretionary down two and a half. That's where um, Amazon and Tesla are. And then communication services down 0.6%. That's where Alphabet and Meta are. So um, that's really the story. Um, it's, as, it's as simple as that. Um, now, you know, I, I didn't really make a commitment to, you know, whether tech can keep going higher or not. We're kind of wishy-washy on it. We're neutral with a slight positive bias on tech. It is expensive, but um, but the earnings have been so good that we're just kind of hanging in there and, and, and you know, going with the momentum. Now, I mentioned broadening out. So if you look at the uh, style indexes last week, you see the growth index was down one and a half, value index up 1.1. That's the kind of rotation that we might start to see, right? And so if if people don't want to pay up for the big techs, they might go into cyclical value. A lot of people have been talking about that. Or they might go to small caps or they might go to international, right? So, um, you know, we saw a little bit better performance out of small caps last week. We saw a very good performance out of cyclical value last week, particularly, you know, energy uh, up nicely. You had good gains in materials, gains in industrials. And then you also saw really strong gains overseas. Look at the EFA up two and a half percent. Part of that was the dollar weakening, but nonetheless, we're starting to see some broadening out. That's where people seem to be going. So this will be bumpy. It'll we'll have you know fits and starts. Um, so we're not ready to you know say this rotation is going to uh, persist and start moving assets in that direction. However, we do think that's something you have to watch uh, really, really closely. So for now, still like U.S. better than international, uh, and still a slight preference for large caps and for growth. So let's go to bonds here, Lawrence. I'll hand it over to you. Um, you know, part of the reason that that the market uh, hung in there, I think, last week is because bonds did so well. Yeah, we did see uh, yields fall last week. Uh, frankly, it was because there wasn't. <clears throat> Excuse me, but there wasn't a lot of new information coming out of uh, Jerome Powell last week. He kind of reiterated in front of Congress that rate cuts are likely going to happen this year. Uh, markets were maybe starting to doubt some of that, uh, or at least repricing uh, the, the amount of, of rate cuts expected this year based upon stronger than uh, expected economic data. But uh, Powell, he, he came in with his his reassuring commentary about you know that the Fed is likely going to cut rates this year. Uh, so we did see yields lower, and that did help, um, frankly, sectors across the the fixed income landscape. Uh, ag, the aggregate bond index, which is the core bond index, up about eighty basis points or 0.8 percent last week. Really, uh, the the the, uh, the the driver of that outperformance or that performance was the mortgage-backed security space. This is a space that we continue continue to like. We think valuations are very attractive relative to uh, lower-rated corporate bonds. You know, these are AAA-rated government guaranteed uh, securities, and they're out yielding these lower rated uh, corporate bonds. Unless we've been overweight that sector in our uh, in our discretionary asset allocation models, and it's good to see them uh, rally on the back of, of that uh, uh, that renewed enthusiasm for rate cuts uh, that, that took place last uh, the la took place la last week. Moving on to the plus sectors, high yield bonds uh, continue to perform well. We're going to talk about the uh, the, the positive developments in terms of issuance trends uh, in, in the high-yield bond market. High-yield bonds, you could argue, are pretty expensive. Uh, so we're neutral on that space. Uh, but given the improving fundamental backdrop and the improved refinancing risk, there, you know, there's an argument that um, we're likely going to see spreads well-contained uh, and, and probably in a trading range over the course of the next couple quarters so. Um, we, but the valuations uh, are, are still a little concerning for us in, in our model portfolios. Uh, the area that we have invested in or that we've taken a kind of an out of benchmark allocation to is preferreds. Uh, yesterday marked the one year anniversary of the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. And when that took place, we got that proverbial baby with the bathwater moment where a lot of these bank preferreds sold off pretty dramatically. And uh, we've been invested in that space uh, 
not not quite a year, but uh, but close to it. So uh, we've enjoyed some some pretty decent returns out of that that sector, uh, and the and valuations continue to look attractive to us in, in that area. So um, mostly high quality uh, up in quality approach for our fixed income allocations, but that is the one area that we are taking a little bit of risk in, in the fixed income book on the preferred side. Uh, and again, it's good to see that the um, that those securities are continue to perform, perform well. Yeah, that was a little bit of a gutsy call back then, but it certainly uh, worked out. And I think you have to, you know, be be pleased with how well the banking sector has held up, particularly regional banks with the commercial real estate exposure and the exposure to just rising interest rates, you know, over the past um, uh, couple years. So yeah, good to sure. See it. And today, uh, I know we're going to talk about the calendar in just a second, but today is the the day that that uh, Fed facility is expires, that bank term funding program, BTFB. There's so many facilities out there. Today's the day that that expires, uh, and the Fed is letting it expire because, by and large, the uh, the financial system looks a lot better now than it did a year ago. Uh, so the, the Fed is comfortable letting that program expire. Yeah, I didn't know that. That's interesting. So the... Um... You know the banking sector looks like it's in in decent shape, um, but we you know we still have some uh, heavy commercial real estate exposure in some of the regional banks that we have to watch. But um, you know overall, it's a pretty healthy banking environment, a pretty healthy credit uh, environment. Good for the economy and and good for markets. So um, thanks for that, Lawrence. Let let's quickly hit on the jobs report. Uh, I'll just show you these these charts. I think it's helpful to see the visual of, of the trend. Right, and so this is just payrolls by month, and then the um, you know the uh, the unemployment in, uh, in in on the orange line unemployment rate. Um, so, you know, first it's obvious that you see in terms of the blue line just payroll numbers. You know, we've gone from you know five hundred, six hundred thousand uh, jobs a month down to you know the two to three hundred range. Actually, that's even a little bit up. We had a couple of readings that were a little lower than that. Um, so we are trending down, but certainly uh, job growth is stabilized. The Fed is obviously watching this closely. And, you know, we, you, Lawrence, you just mentioned it. They're preparing to cut probably in June, could be sooner. President Biden thinks the rate cut's coming sooner, <laughs> which I thought, or soon, which I thought was very interesting. Um, I think that was on, uh, might have been on Saturday when he made that comment. But at any rate... Uh, Powell's told us uh, pretty much directly that um, they're getting close to a rate cut. So this job, the job market is healthy, but it's not too strong uh, that would that would prevent um, uh, the Fed from from cutting rates. Also, you know, you might look at that two seventy five and say it's hot. That was the you know the job number that we got on Friday for February. It was about seventy five thousand above expectations, but the downward revisions actually turned it into a soft report because we had much more than 75,000 jobs taken out of previous months, right? Just 124,000 out of January alone. So, you know, maybe it's Goldilocks, maybe it was a little softer than you'd like to see, but uh, certainly doesn't change what the Fed's doing. And then here's average hourly earnings, right? The wage number, uh, it's down almost to four, which is you know, not where you want to be, probably want to be in the threes. But if productivity is strong, you can still have a 4% wage number and, you know, grow GDP at 2%, not, you know, not have uh, um, an inflation problem, right? The, the problem is when wages, when you don't have productivity and you have to keep hiring more workers and wages grow, um, that, that gets you into a little bit of a... Uh, a tricky spot, right? So we we're okay with four percent wage growth. Like to get it a little bit lower, but the Fed again is seeing this. They're seeing all the other wage metrics that they look at, and there are many of them. And um, it's telling them that they can cut. So is June still your expectation, Lawrence? Are we still looking at you know three or four cuts this year, or or have your views changed on them? Yeah. So our our base case is. Likely four rate cuts. It wouldn't surprise us if we get three, uh, but we just think that the trajectory is lower. Uh, there's been some discussion about potentially having rate hikes come back into the picture, but that was all but squashed over the 
past week or so by Fed officials saying that if inflationary pressures continue to run hotter than expected, they'll just stay at these levels for longer. So we think the next move is lower, lower yields or lower rates. Uh, but it, it's it's been repriced a couple times, but the, the current pricing has about a 90% probability that June is the month that the Fed goes and we, we, uh, that and that's um, uh, in line with kind of our expectations as well. A couple quick comments though about what the two charts that you just showed. What was interesting is that watching the the bond market, being the bond geek that I am, I watched the, the bond market on like a, a tick by tick basis in some of these data releases. And we initially saw yields spike higher after that 275,000 job number because it was above expectations. But then when you start to look under the hood, you realize those revisions were a lot more market moving than the the headline number was. Uh, so it was it was pretty interesting to watch the um, the erratic behavior out of the bond market on on Friday. And of course, the the, uh, the, the wage pressures that you're showing here is is uh, another reason why we did see yields ultimately end up to lower on the day, uh, despite the, that high headline number, is because it does look like those wage pressures are moderating, moderating a little bit. Just as economists expected. So uh, pretty uh, pretty Goldilocks on the wage number and on the um, the job ads. So good to see, still kind of on track uh, where we thought we'd be. Um, so let's, uh, we'll keep rolling with the bond theme, because that's basically where we were on the jobs report and uh, and talk about, about high yield. So um, the, uh, you, you mentioned Lawrence, when we were putting this together, that the maturity wall is pushed out. What's, what's doing that and, and, and what does it mean? Yeah. So the, the big thing really in the, the fixed income markets this year has been the amount of supply about the amount of new bonds that are coming to market, uh, that are at really record levels for a lot of these, these markets, uh, but what's been interesting is that there's been record demand as well for these bonds. Just another rule that shows that uh, you know, supply tends to follow demand. And with, with demand picking up this year, with the expectation of lower yields later on in the year and into the next couple of years, uh, there's a lot of institutional investors out there that are just buying up everything that's coming to market. And companies are seeing that and saying, all right, we're going to issue a lot more debt because there's a lot more demand. So we are seeing record levels of debt come to the market. Uh, what we're showing here is the investment grade universe, which is blue, the high yield uh, bond index, which is is orange. Remember, we're not even at the midpoint of, of March yet, but we're already almost at levels that uh, would feel like a, a full year for uh, for you know the high yield market. And then uh, we're getting close to you know, 500 billion of new issuance. Uh, for the investment grade universe, which a, a good year is around 1.4 trillion, so there's been a lot of bonds come to market, and markets haven't moved. There's been so much demand that a lot of these issues are what's called oversubscribed, meaning that if there's a hundred million dollar bond issuance coming to market. There's 500 million dollars waiting to invest in that deal. So uh, that's really been the, the the big takeaway this year is that there's just a ton of demand taking down this this record amount of supply. And the so what, if we go to the next uh, slide, is that it's allowed a lot of these high yield companies to re or to refinance their existing debt, push out that refinancing risk, and uh, and, and really push out the, um, I guess, kick the can down the road a couple of years before they have to start paying back this debt. Coming into this year, we had a, a pretty big concern about refinancing risks, particularly for the, the lower rated companies, these triple C rated companies. Uh, but given the strong demand and the very open primary market, these companies uh, were able to refinance their debt, very little give up or, or very little uh, you know, uh, concern about getting that paper refinanced. Uh, and um, you know, it, it's really worked out well for a lot of these companies. To your point, uh, this, it, this improves the kind of the, the, the balance sheet for a lot of companies. Uh, so they're able to hire and they're able to, to continue to grow. And you know, uh, certainly this is good news for the economy, good news for corporate America, and good good news for employees as well, because it does allow companies to continue to hire now that they've got their, their financing issues in order. Yeah, that's excellent. And it, I would I would say this connects to small caps. We, we've been a little bit cautious on small caps, but they're starting to perk up a little bit and, and, and catch our our eye um you know small caps tend to need to go to banks to refi more than the larger companies if you have a healthy relatively healthy high yield market 
um, that that could help smaller companies and maybe make create some market interest uh, down the market cap chain. I, I would think. Yeah. Uh, so high yield companies do tend to be the smaller uh, smaller cap companies out there. If you think about the investment grade corporate universe, it's your Apples, your GMs, your WalMarts, all that kind of stuff. This the high yield universe is is primarily a single product company or or really smaller cap companies. So their ability to kind of again kick the can down the road into this 2028 20, 2029 20, period when they have to start worrying about debt again uh, is is a, a big weight off of a, a, a lot of their shoulders. So it should help some of these smaller cap companies um, do well on a go forward basis. Yeah, I know. You know, we're still not being aggressive in terms of how we position fixed income portfolios, but it's it's comforting to know that that high yields in a bit better shape. And you know, if folks have a really high quality fixed income portfolio, maybe maybe a little bit of high yield would be okay, at least in the near term. While corporate America is in such good shape, we know we got a great earnings season. The economy looks like it's going to continue to grow uh, for the next several quarters. You know, maybe keep those positions small, but um, you may argue with me, Lawrence, but I don't. I don't think a small position in in high yield, you know, as long as the whole bond portfolio is conservatively positioned, is is necessarily a, a terrible idea. No, I, I would be I would be cautious though in terms of valuations. Again, the, the additional compensation sure. for owning high yield debt isn't great, uh, but at the in the meantime, you're getting six seven percent type yields where you can clip the coupon and. Uh, and and um, and to your point, as long as the economy doesn't fall into a recession, which it's, I mean, the economic data continues to outperform. So as long as the the economy continues to perform well, growth may slow, but that's still going to be a, a pretty conducive environment for for corporate credit. Yeah, maybe the higher quality end of high yield makes sense. Maybe just as a trade. Um, I know this. You know, our house view is still that um, you know to be up in quality, high quality corporates as opposed to. Uh, to high yield. So um, thanks for that, Lawrence. Let's let's move on to gold. This was the topic of the weekly market commentary this week, uh, written by um, Adam Turnquist, frequent um, guest of Market Signals. So um, I'm going to do my best to walk through these charts that Adam put in here uh, to make the case that gold actually looks interesting. So you know, for folks who think that this market has come too far too fast, and again, you know. LPR research is neutral equities, and we're we're staying neutral equities for now. Um, it might make sense to take a little bit off here, and that you know those equities. If you do think you want to take a little bit of risk off, those equities have to go somewhere. So where do they go? Well, like I said, maybe you know cyclical value, small caps, international. You know those are equities. Well, what about considering some alternative investments, uh, maybe commodities, and within. Those areas, gold actually looks really interesting to us. Uh, it just broke out to a new all-time high. You can see that on this chart. Uh, you know, it took a while to break through uh, 2,000, but we did that, and now up. Uh, you know, making a run at 2,200. Uh, the gold likes a weak dollar. We're certainly starting to see that. Gold likes lower rates because, and here's where I can bring you in, Lawrence. The you know, gold doesn't offer any yield. So when yields are high, it's a competitive threat to gold as an investment, right? Because there's a higher opportunity cost of owning gold and not getting that yield. So gold likes falling rates, actually specifically falling real rates, which is inflation adjusted rates. So we are seeing rates come down. And I think that's part of the story for why gold is making this run. But we're also seeing a weaker dollar. <clears throat> it's very hard to predict where the dollar is going to go. I think it's pretty fair to assume it's going to be weak versus the yen in the year term, in the near term. But versus the euro, that's a hard call to make because they're the Fed and the ECB are both racing to cut rates. Might do it at the same time. Who knows? Probably coming in June, maybe a little sooner. That's not really a big currency swing factor. <clears throat> so, you know, hard to call. So that it's a it's a wild card, uh, we'll say. Um, but rates, rates in the dollar are the big, <clears throat> big drivers, I think right now, uh, Lawrence thoughts on the impact of rates and gold. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it earlier. We have seen <clears throat> yields fall from levels, call it back in, uh, last, last September, October, uh, you know, and that kind of is correlated with a, a, a decent run in gold 
as well. To your point about real real yields, these tips yields, these inflation adjusted yields, uh, we we're really positive on tips back in September uh, with real yields at the highest levels they've been in quite some time. But uh, to your point, they have fallen back into more still uh, still on the elevated side over the over the past decade, but not nearly as attractive as they were a couple months ago. So. Um, there is that trade-off, and and you could really make the argument that uh, that gold is is a a pretty decent option uh, outside of just under traditional stocks and bonds given valuations for for both of those markets. Yeah, and inflation is the one piece that you have to watch. As long as inflation kind of stays about where it is, or maybe only comes down gradually, that might not be a headwind to gold. You know, if if inflation goes up, real rates go down. And you know, gold likes railroads going down. Inflation could cause them to, you know, stay where they are or go higher. So we have to watch the inflation piece. Gold has several different drivers. Um, and then you know, I'll also add on the bottom of this chart, you have the um, relative strength index. Right, over seventy is overbought. We talked about how the S and P is not there anymore. <clears throat> but look at gold; it's uh, it's blown through that seventy mark, and um, you know, is very overbought. So. Could make sense to 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 wait for a pullback there uh for um exposure but this could be you know kind of a a little bit of a hedge we'll say something that maybe won't be correlated to the equity markets uh certainly there are a lot of interesting ideas within the alternative investments universe that similarly are not as correlated to um to um equity prices so you can look you know consider some of those uh as well but um gold really a nice chart and uh, even though it's a little ahead of itself, maybe uh, we think it can go higher from here. One of the other reasons we think it can go higher is because central banks are buying. So this chart that Adam put together shows net purchases of golds by central banks globally, major central banks. Uh, and um, you got this big uptick in 2022 and 2023. It's certainly related to uh, sanctions on Russia, starting with the invasion of Ukraine. And just the tough geopolitical environment beyond that has caused central banks to diversify. So it's not just diversifying into other currencies, it's diversifying into commodities and other assets. So there's a little bit of Bitcoin floating around in, on some central bank balance sheets as well. Uh, so this diversification uh, by central banks is a tailwind for gold, certainly. Uh, and then, um, you know, ETFs for gold aren't new. But, um, you know, we're starting to see, <clears throat> or I guess as we've seen this gold rally, we've actually started to see um, ETF holdings of the gold commodity come down. So maybe there's an opportunity to reverse that and see some, um, you know, some flows into the uh, the ETFs. So um, that's high level gold. For more details, uh, you can check out our weekly market commentary on um on lpl.com so uh let's preview the week lawrence and um and then wrap i mean i th i think it's obvious that cpi is the most important data point of the week and um you get the ppi with it so cpi tuesday so that'll be when we release this podcast so folks listening will already know that cpi number presumably uh the ppi comes on thursday along with retail sales. So retail sales matter, but we're just in this environment where inflation seems to matter more than more than retail sales, frankly, which is only a small part of overall consumer spending. So it matters, but it's it's secondary. Um so based on what I've read, Lawrence, on um on the CPI situation, it it, it looks like we might get a little bit below this consensus number. So you know, I'm not an economist that's, you know, Jeff Roach would have a more educated opinion on maybe where the CPI comes in. But based on what I've seen, I think we've got maybe a tiny bit of a downside bias. Um, you know, that might be with with rounding up 0.4% month over month uh, rather than up 0.3 the prior month. Um, but uh, I, I think we're going to end up kind of being in line or maybe just a fraction below uh, based on what I've seen, any any thoughts there? Yeah, and of course, yeah, it is right to, to focus on the month over month numbers. Those are the most important, really, because of the 
the, the improvements in pro or the improvement in inflation over the past year. Uh, so some of those uh, older readings are still embedded in those year over year figures. So month over month is important. I would say watch uh, for services X housing. Everyone knows the housing issues with CPI and the, the big weight that there is in that, that uh, statistic. But core services X housing was an unexpected surprise higher last month. So if there's some moderation in that in that um, category or those those categories, I think you could see a, a a pretty big rally out of the the fixed income markets, which would in which would likely imply a, a pretty big rally out of the equity markets as well. No no guarantees, of course, uh, but that was the kind of the 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 stubborn, sticky inflation people were talking about last month. So uh, we'll have to see how that uh, that plays out for for February. Yeah, the core year over year is probably going to get the most attention. 3.7% expected, down 0.2% from the prior month's year over year reading. So it's it's going to continue. The, if it hits that number, it's going to continue the trajectory uh, moving in the right direction. And again, pointing to uh, Fed rate cuts before too long here. I'm just looking at the bond market now. You know, we are ticking up a basis point or two this morning on uh, or this uh, early this afternoon. Uh, 409 on the 10 year yield and, um, you know, still kind of lower end of the very recent range, but, uh, maybe there's a little bit of anxiety, uh, in that, you know, we're a day away from the CPI and you might just see people kind of, I don't know, adjusting positions, uh, ahead of this, this key number tomorrow morning at eight thirty uh, Eastern, I guess, um, you know, on the retail sales number, which is you know, probably the second most important economic data point. Uh, it's really a lot of autos noise. So, um, you know, we had the big drop last month uh, or two months ago, really, because this data comes out with a lag. Uh, we had the big drop and now um, economists expect that number to bounce back. So after a 0.8% decline in uh, uh, in January, economists are expecting a 0.8% increase uh, overall for February, but you know if you take out the autos <clears throat> and gasoline, frankly, you're only up 0.2 according to economists. Now this is just a forecast; we could be off. This number has you know more um, variation to it than the the CPI numbers, which are being so closely watched. Uh, so even without the autos and gas, mm -hmm. economists are saying that we're going to bounce back from that hangover that we had in January after the holidays and see a pickup in consumer spending in, in, in February. You certainly had a strong job market uh, to support it in recent months. And, you know, we don't talk a lot about the wealth effect, but you have people making money in the stock market. And that certainly has, um, you know, you'd have to think uh, certainly has some impact on uh, consumer spending. So any other comments, uh, Lawrence, on the, the week ahead? Anything else here you think might get some attention or... Anything to add to retail sales? Just the um, uh, the again that that Fed facility that's closing today. Just real quickly, that if there is concern amongst the banks, they have the ability to borrow for for one year from now. So, despite the fact that that facility is closing today, any sort of issues probably won't take place until one year from today, uh, because again, if they they are able to, these banks are able to borrow uh, today and not have to pay that money back for a year. So. Uh, I know we, I've gotten questions about should people be concerned about this facility closing, and and I would say no, uh, because again they can borrow, keep that that loan in place for a year until they have to pay that back. So uh, if there are some regional banks or other banking institutions out there that are um, perhaps teetering, they can get a, a loan and not have to worry about paying that back for another year. Uh, so the fact that it's closing is is not a big or should not be a big market moving event. The other thing is. No Fed speak this week, which is a welcome change from prior weeks. We tend to get too much Fed speak in my view, but we're in that blackout period until the Fed meets next week. So uh, that should help keep some uh, some volatility muted on in some of these markets. Well, so with all that time, we're going to save Lawrence from Fed speak. We can follow the NFL free agency period. Which is starting now. I know your Tampa Bay Bucks uh, made some news uh, over the weekend, and we can go out and see the movies that won all the awards last night that we haven't seen yet. I just started Oppenheimer, but I haven't I haven't finished it yet. So uh, 
got got some catching up to do uh, with movies. So uh, well, I like saving a little bit of time, not having to pay so much attention to the Fed speak. Same here, for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Actually, you know what? I don't love the Fed speak, even if it's not a big week for seeing movies and, and watching free agents sign with football teams. Um, so um, let's go ahead and wrap up there. Thanks, Lawrence, for, for joining. Thanks for uh, the insights on the bond market, which, as you know, I do not know much about. Um, just in the interest of being civil, be nice to those Duke fans down in, in the Carolinas where you are, because um, you never know. It could could go the other way next year. We'll, we'll, we'll see. So be nice. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening, as always, to LPL Market Signals. We'll be back with you next week. Thanks so much. Take care, everybody.